Let's begin today's episode by shouting out the folks out there that are working right now during these scary times. Medical workers, grocery store workers, mail and delivery drivers, and anyone and everyone right now who is still working outside their homes. Thank you for what you do, and Godspeed. In light of the chaotic situation in hospitals right now, I figured some spooky stories set in hospitals would be perfect. Of course, these stories won't concern current events, because that just doesn't seem right. Enjoy these stories and remember to send me your scary experiences at darkstories.org. I'm currently on the lookout for stories about lockdowns, unrelated to current events of course, as well as sea creatures and out at sea stories. Now, let's begin. You get used to it. From The Other Malfoy. I worked as a security guard at one of the local hospitals, and despite what I'm going to tell you, it's a pretty great place to work. Plentiful hours, pay is good, and the nurses are downright sweet. That being said, it is still a hospital, and as such, it comes with its bad things. I confess, and forgive me if I come across as a little bit morbid, I've been in the presence of more death in the first six months on the job than the previous 30 years of my entire life. But that's not exactly what this is about. No, this story is about the hospital basement. I had initially been hired to work a specific area of the hospital, and I had daytime hours. But when a full-time evening shift opened up, I went for it. and Gotta make that money. This meant I had free range to patrol the whole property, one of the areas I got to patrol was the basement. Contrary to what you might think, it's a pretty busy part of the building. X-ray department, custodian, engineering, food prep, those are just some of the many departments that fill the basement. So it's not exactly a spooky, damp, and dark place. But once 8pm hits and the vast majority of employees have gone home, that basement gets quiet. And that's when the incidents began. It was my first week as patrol officer, and so far, it had been rather uneventful, which I was fine with. I had had five years' experience with private security in other areas, and I was hoping for less action for a while. One night, I was making my rounds in the basement when I heard footsteps. Normally, this is no big deal, but it was very late, so it drew my attention Still, I wasn't thinking it was a big deal. Maybe a nurse had to grab something or a visitor took a hilariously big wrong turn. So I wandered over in that direction. As I approached the corner, I checked the wall mirror. For those of you who don't know, hospitals have ball-shaped mirrors to allow staff to check around corners, thus preventing any gurney fender benders. When I did this, I saw nothing. No people, no shadows, no movement of any sort. I rounded the corner to make sure, and it was an empty hallway. Only place they could turn into were the elevators, which I would have heard the ding from if someone had entered them. It was strange, but I shrugged it off. Probably my brain messing with me. A similar incident happened a few days later. While checking to make sure engineering didn't leave their equipment in plain sight, again, I suddenly hear voices. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but it was for sure human voices. I went to check, out of curiosity more than anything else, but no matter where I walked, the voices always seemed distant. I didn't see anyone, and I must have walked the entire basement but the voices always sounded so distant. Then, suddenly, it went quiet, just like that. It was as if they had disappeared, left the area. How very strange, but, again, I chalked it up to nothing unusual. Maybe a custodian left a radio or podcast on. In my mind, it was all easily explained, and no big deal. While that could have been explained easily enough, this next one was unnerving, 
because I still cannot explain it. It was another day, another basement patrol. I was walking down a large stretch of hallway when in front of me, I noticed a set of doors closing. These are fire doors that are held open magnetically and automatically close upon the fire alarm going off, which incidentally had happened earlier. A false alarm, though. Clearly, these two hadn't been pushed open after the all-clear, so I walked towards them to do the job myself. Then one of them opened up, not swung open aggressively, but just casually opened up, like someone was just passing through. This caused me to stop in my tracks in shock. These doors are quite heavy. Nobody could have just yanked it open and ducked out of sight like that. This door was pushed to the wall all the way in a smooth motion, not shoved, not opened slightly, unless there was a very specifically located hurricane in that spot, those doors were not hit by a sudden draft. Needless to say, I patrolled a more populated area that night. There were also the cold spots. So many cold spots in that basement. It wasn't wind or air conditioning, these were specific moments of cold that randomly disappeared shortly afterwards. These were not normal. They were everywhere, not just the same spots every time, different spots, spots where it should have been warm, like by the food prep kitchen or near the CT scan room. It just didn't really make sense. A few weeks of this and I was just doing my best to ignore it. Job paid well and I didn't want to abandon ship like that, but that nearly changed one evening. I was on another basement patrol. Woo-hoo, I guess. Sadly, I couldn't skip it or say that I did. The higher-ups would know. They always know. So I'm back again, late at night, in the creepy, empty basement, reminding myself that my car will be paid off a lot faster with this salary. I approached the corner from the first incident. Coincidentally, instinctively, I checked the wall mirror. I froze. There I saw a figure around the corner. Not a person, but a human-shaped black mass. Just standing there, just around the corner. I'm horrified at this point. My mind was already on high alert. Now it was on red alert. I tried to reason with myself. Is it a smudge on the mirror? No, they clean those things daily. I was scared, shaking wishing I had a fellow guard with me. But what good would that really do, honestly? I'm praying to God, Odin, Ra, freaking Santa Claus at this point, praying that this thing does not decide to move towards me. I'm standing there for what seemed like forever, when it finally walks the opposite direction of me. Defying all sense of reason, I decided to poke my head around the corner, try to get a look at this thing, it was gone by then, disappeared. I even checked the mirror again, and it was clear as well. Just me in the basement. I scrambled upstairs on a sprint and spent the shift around the nurse's station, expecting very little sleep that night when I made it home. A couple of months later, short of the aforementioned cold spots, things had calmed down. I began working an earlier shift, and I was down in the basement with a co-worker doing the rounds, when I heard the sound of voices. Now, admittedly, this could be anyone that time of day, but I was still quite paranoid about the basement, so my mind instantly goes to the worst possible explanation. I stopped, then turned to my co-worker. Then I asked, probably sounding freaked out, if they could hear the voices. To my immense relief, they said yes, and I calmed down. Then my coworker said, You get used to it. I instantly stopped and stared at them. What do you mean by that? I asked. Voices, weird noises, all that crap. Work here long enough and you just get used to it, especially down here. I assume you've seen or heard something. Judging by how you looked like a deer in the headlights just now. 
I nod and explain my experiences. They say, Yeah, most of us have all had similar incidents when patrolling down here. Don't worry about it. You'll learn to shrug it off. I'll add quickly that this coworker is older than me and has been with the company for about 15 years, which to me explained how they were so casual and nonchalant about it while I was losing my mind. But why this area? I asked. Never anywhere else. Do you really have to ask? They laughed, and then it hit me, and I almost kicked myself for not figuring it out sooner. The silhouette, the footsteps, the voices, the door, even the majority of cold spots, they all happened within a close proximity of the morgue. I'd been given a tour of the facility when I started, but seeing as I was assigned a specific post when I began, I kind of just forgot about the morgue and where it was located. Why wasn't I told? I asked them. Because if we had just told you outright, you probably wouldn't have believed us. Admit it, they responded. And I can admit they were probably right. If they had mentioned it on day one, I would have laughed it off as either messing with the new guy or just silly stories. So I can't blame them. I worked at that hospital for a year before being transferred to a different site. Still a hospital, but this one doesn't have an ER, ICU, or a morgue. So I feel better about it. My coworkers are great and the job still pays well, and I genuinely want to be here but I still double-check those mirrors when I approach any corner, and I still jump at any sound when I'm alone at night on the job, and I hope against hope that I'll eventually get used to it. My Mom's Experience with the Dead From Daniela S. My mom was in the hospital when she was 23. She'd gotten in a really bad motorcycle accident and had broken both her legs. She'd also hurt her head really bad. It was late in the night and she woke up from a very restless sleep, but she didn't open her eyes right away for some reason. Something in her told her to keep them shut. My mom is from Vietnam and grew up in a very spiritual family. This subject isn't something she takes lightly. When she finally did open her eyes, it was because of a murmur, like someone was trying to talk to her. Her hospital bed was surrounded by pale people. The whole room seemed to be filled with pale people, all trying to get a good look at her. But as soon as she looked at them, they all began to look down at their feet. She was in such shock that she kind of just calmed down and tried to make sense of it. The murmuring grew louder and louder until it sounded like the whole room was quietly mumbling, dozens of people mumbling to each other, but she couldn't see anyone's lips actually move. Then one of them lifted their hand and tried to reach out to her, still not looking at her. That's when my mom began to panic and scream. She says it felt like she blacked out until a nurse came running in, but my mom was found sitting up in bed. The nurse told her it was probably a hallucination from her concussion, and after a long time of soothing her, mom finally went back to sleep. She didn't experience anything else until she got pregnant with me, and we moved to Korea. One day as she was taking the bus, she noticed that amongst a line of people getting on was a very familiar figure, a pale person who only looked at the ground. They boarded the bus. The bus driver didn't even seem to acknowledge them. My mother began to cry and became hysterical when the person moved down the middle of the bus. It was then she saw that they seemed to be floating. Their feet were flat against nothing beneath them. An older woman came to comfort her, and when mom looked back where the person had been, they were gone. From that day until we moved to America, she had no further problems. 
Eventually, she would be pregnant with my brother, and she began seeing these people everywhere. In the stores, in the streets, and even outside our home. It was a difficult pregnancy. She ended up going to the hospital a number of times, with smaller complications. When she was there, she would scream and cry if she was ever left alone. In the hospitals, it's where she saw them most. She said they were everywhere. Every which way she looked, they were there. The only way she'd feel safe was if someone was with her, because then the strange, pale people wouldn't come any closer. The night after she gave birth to my brother, we were all sleeping in one room because she'd been pretty wrecked by the delivery. The hard pregnancy was nothing compared to actually giving birth to him. Dad says she nearly died, but I don't know how much of that is true. She woke up again in the middle of the night with my brother next to her, and again her bed was surrounded by those people. One of them was holding her hand on the baby's forehead, and at first my mom freaked until she noticed how my brother was pale. But instead of calling out for help, she didn't move. The pale woman stroked the baby's hair over and over, until he began to grow pink again, and finally, he took a breath. Then she woke up in the morning as a nurse came in to look at the baby. The pale people were gone. Dad and I were still sleeping, and nothing seemed different. The nurse looked over my brother and said that he was fine. Mom says that at that moment, she realized that whoever they were, they weren't trying to hurt or scare her. She thinks they're just lost souls or something of the sort, and that her son did almost die that night. But one of them helped him back to life. Then again, maybe it was all dreams, hallucinations. But she tells this story with such sincerity that I can't help but believe her. Now she only sees a few in times of great stress, and she never gets scared of them now. But I still worry. I'm not 100% sure they're good guys. I'm scared that the one who held her hand on my brother wasn't giving him life, but perhaps I'd been the one taking it. I've heard of spirits taking living bodies to come back to the real world. I just hope mom is right about them. The Cold Hallway from C. E. Scrivener. Everyone has different beliefs in the paranormal, but I've always been fascinated by it. It's sort of a hobby for me, I guess. But after this experience, I'll forever have a new perspective on the unexplained. This happened a few years ago when a friend of mine was in a serious car accident. Me and a group of our friends went to the hospital to visit, but he was still in surgery, so we sat in the waiting room for any news. At one point, I got restless and decided to make my way to the cafeteria for some coffee. It was the very early hours of the morning. As I'm making my way down the somewhat empty halls, I hear footsteps approaching me from behind. I turned, expecting to find a nurse or maybe one of my friends coming to join me. But there was no one in the hall. The corridor was silent, save for the few normal noises like machines or the muffled, distant chatter of workers. Something felt off, but I tried to ignore it, as me not being a fan of hospitals. I turned to continue walking. That's when a sudden feeling washed over me, and I froze in place. You know that tingling feeling you get when someone is standing behind you? Goosebumps wash over you and you turn expecting to see someone. This is what I did, but I was once again met with the emptiness of the hallway. The feeling persisted, and I felt all the hair on my body standing on end. The air became cold to the point I could see my breath. I couldn't hear the previous sounds of machines or chatting now. It was like a switch was flipped and everything became muffled. 
I was petrified. I didn't know what was happening nor what to do. I wanted to run, but my legs wouldn't work. I tried to speak, but no sound came out. It was like something had taken complete control of me. For what felt like hours being held by this cold, unseen force, I then felt a sudden rush of coldness, as if something had just passed right through me. And just like that, it was gone. I stood there in shock, trying to figure out what had just happened to me. You felt it, didn't you? I suddenly heard a voice, and I looked to find an old woman in a hospital gown walking past me to what I assume was her room. What do you mean? I asked, confused, and she looked back and smiled at me. It comes whenever someone dies around here. Don't worry, it won't hurt you. She spoke almost amused by my shock. What comes? I asked, not really sure if I wanted to know. The woman gave me another smile. The Reaper, honey. After that exchange, I noped out of there at record speed, nearly falling over my own feet, until I made it to the waiting room. I chose not to share my experience with my friends. They would have just told me I was tired, but I knew it was more than that. Sadly, soon after that experience, we received the unfortunate news that our friend had passed away. His brain injury was too severe. We went home in complete silence, and the next day, I could not stop thinking about what happened. What I felt that day, I know was not natural. Could I have really encountered a reaper? And I can't help but wonder, was it there for my friend? Ghost in the Asylum From Insulting I have a very real ghost encounter to tell you. It happened at a very populated haunted attraction. The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum is a hospital in Weston, West Virginia that is rumored to be haunted. And let me tell you that there is no rumor about it because I know it's 100% true. It was Halloween. I was 17 and had a bunch of friends with me at the time. First, I've got to explain that the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum offers you a deal. If you pay $100 a person, you can stay the night at the haunted hospital, and if you stay till 5 a.m., you get 70% of your money back. We all decided that this year was the year we were going to stay the night. The nighttime stay didn't start until 11 p.m., so we decided to go do the haunted house tour and a couple of other spooky things to wait it out. When 11 p.m. came around, we hurried and ran to the front doors of the asylum and walked in. There were six of us in total, three guys and three girls. It was $600 to do this haunted night stay. When you stay the night at this haunted hospital... You are given an EMF reader and a flashlight. They took our phones because they didn't want us to use the flash or to use the flashlight on them. We were so lucky because we were the only group that was staying the night on Halloween. So after they went over the rules with us, we would be on our own until 5 a.m. Well, if you could last that long. I'll tell you a little bit about the haunted asylum. It has a total of three floors and was constructed in the 1800s. At first, it was a hospital meant to house older, sick patients and to give them the best care they could. But the 200 limit quickly turned to 2,000, and the hospital was so packed, they had people on hospital beds in the hallways. Now, our group was aware that this place was a place where people would send their loved ones. It said their loved ones would be experimented on and often killed. But of course, this is what excited us about staying the night, as well as the thought of catching a glimpse of a ghost. At 2.40 a.m., we walked all the halls and looked in all the rooms, but never saw anything. 
but we soon did hear the sound of a girl singing. It seemed to be a lullaby coming from down the hall. I quickly looked at my friends to see their reactions, and they were just as stunned and frightened as I was. We quickly pointed our flashlights down the hallway where the singing was coming from and made our approach to the room. I could finally start to hear the song itself, something like, Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Mama's gonna kill all of these little girls. And when the little girls are gone, Mama's gonna kill the rest of them. That's when my flashlight went out, then Ashley's, and so did Ethan's. Those were the only three flashlights the guide gave us, and now we had nothing to help us see. The only thing lighting the hallway and the rooms was the moonlight from the full moon shining through some cracks in the roof. We were two doors away from the room with the singing, and I swear I could make out a half-body and face leaning out of the room, looking right at us. Just then, a cloud or something must have moved, because a beam of moonlight shone through one of the cracks and right on the figure. It was a woman in white. Her face was scarred up, and she was looking right at us with an awful grin. Her eyes were as black as the night, and she had this almost rotten egg smell coming off of her. She took a step out of the door and into the hallway. To my horror, she appeared to be holding the severed arm of a child. She starts to take steps towards us, but has a funny movement to her, almost like she's glitching one foot after another. The smell gets worse as she approaches, then a cloud or something blocks the moonlight again, and she vanishes. I started to walk backwards, shaking and wanting to soil myself. I'd never been so scared. Travis. Someone whispered right beside me. I could hear my name. Travis, you and your friends will never leave this place. Quickly, I scream for it to shut up, and I turn 180 degrees. We all take off in a dead sprint towards the stairs. It's such a long run, and I can hear someone behind us dragging their feet, knocking things over in the hall. As I look back, some more moonlight is coming through, giving me just enough light to see that woman sprinting at us, screaming our names. I almost tripped over the railing down the staircase as we all ran over each other to get to the front door. But there was a problem. They don't want you to leave without letting a staff member know, so the front doors are locked, and the only way to let someone know that you want out is to ring a bell next to the door that will alert someone to come let you out. Well, we start ringing the hell out of that bell, but I could hear just the lowest and quiet whisper repeatedly saying, Travis, Travis. I glance back one more time. I see her at the top of the steps looking down on us with that god-awful grin. Right after I saw her, the door swung open as we basically stampeded over the staff member who unlocked it for us. We were safe. They fixed up some hot cocoa and let us explain what happened. The spooky thing is that the staff didn't have the reaction I was looking for. They didn't laugh or say we were lying. They had a look of, I know exactly what you saw. Needless to say, after this encounter, we never stayed the night there again. We still do go every year to the haunted house part, but I will not ever set foot back in that asylum. To the listeners out there, believe me or not, but I encourage you to come to Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum and experience it yourself. But be warned, things do happen there, and that ghost lady we saw... She's supposedly named Emily, and supposedly back in 1867, she was taking care of a little girl, but not in a loving way. 
She could not stand the girl's crying, so after singing her a lullaby, she smothered the girl with a pillow. And, well, you can probably guess the rest. Never Look Behind You From Paranormal Poltergeist 666 I come from a small town in Virginia. This town also happens to be home to a well-known abandoned insane asylum. In simple terms, the building sits overlooking my small town and was originally opened as a school in the 1890s, but was shut down in 1911 after a few homicides. In 1916, it was reopened as an experimental psychiatric facility. There were constant issues with overcrowding and negligence. The hospital was shut down in 2003. If the story behind the building isn't enough to keep you away, let my experience be a warning to you to stay out. It all began a few months ago when the owners of the building began to advertise a public paranormal investigation event. As I'd always been fascinated by the paranormal, I decided to buy my boyfriend and I tickets to the event. I had just started making a YouTube channel, and had decided that this would make a great first video. However, that video never made it onto my channel. A couple of weeks later, I stood outside of the beautifully broken building with amazement in my eyes. I always saw beauty and destruction when it came to abandoned buildings like this one. As soon as we were escorted inside of the main area of the building, the atmosphere changed quickly. A feeling of dread surrounded me and it suddenly felt as though I had an extra hundred pounds on my shoulders. The air was so heavy it felt as though I was suffocating. I decided to ignore the uneasiness around me and I took a deep breath as I followed the group up the stairway into the patient corridors. The tour guide began to tell the story of a ten-year-old boy who became a patient to the hospital in the 1940s, but unfortunately he died a few weeks later. As soon as the tour guide finished his sentence with, and then he died, a door to my left suddenly swung open with violent force and slammed into the wall behind it, allowing pieces of drywall to fall to the floor. I flung my body back towards my boyfriend and my heart began to race. However, I decided to continue the tour anyway. Eventually, it concluded with little interaction from spirits, but then the real horror began. My boyfriend and I split off with some other people and made our way down the stairs toward the basement for the investigation portion of the night. I'd always heard that the basement was one of the most active spots in the building, so I wanted to set the camera up there and try to capture something. As we were making our way down the corridor, my boyfriend and the other five or six people were a few feet ahead of me talking amongst themselves I followed behind them at a slow pace, as I wasn't sure I wanted to be down here after what I had experienced upstairs. All of a sudden, I felt a tug on the back of my shirt, and I heard a harsh whisper say my name. Jenny! I didn't dare turn to look and see what was standing behind me. Instead, I broke free from the grasp of this thing and sprinted to join the rest of the group in the middle of the corridor. A little bit of time had passed and my boyfriend and I decided to set up our camera in the morgue, which was a portion of the basement. We wanted to make an attempt to communicate with the spirits through flashlight signals. Is there anyone here? I asked, pointing towards the flashlight that I had propped up on a small wooden chair. If so, make this light turn off. Immediately, the flashlight begins to frantically flash on and off, and I feel the same tug on the back of my shirt. Jenny! It repeated its harsh whisper again. It repeated it over and over. I did all I could to attempt to break free from the force behind me. However, this time I could not move. I screamed at my boyfriend to get help, and he quickly ran out the door and into the corridor. However, it felt like fire was burning at my skin, on my back, and all of a sudden I had an overwhelming urge to turn around in an attempt to make the pain stop. I swiftly maneuvered my body to face towards the force and immediately made contact 
with glowing maple-colored eyes of a tall shadow figure behind me. I felt myself stop screaming, and my body froze up. I stood staring at the shadow figure as a sinister smile spread across its face. As I continued to stare into its eyes, I felt drawn towards it. It felt like hours before my boyfriend ran back in with a security guard, when I knew in fact it had only been a few minutes. Just as they frantically burst through the door, the force released its grip on me and dissipated as if it had never been there. I felt as though I was in a trance while my boyfriend grabbed all the equipment and grabbed my wrist, dragging me up the stairs. Once we arrived in the parking lot, I was finally able to break free from that trance I was in and begin to cry and break down. That was the scariest thing I'd ever experienced. As I look back on the events now, I would like to think that the events that night were caused by an emotional breakdown from stress, but I think my boyfriend and I both know it was far more than that. Now I'm finding it very difficult not to be drawn to the building once again. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. More scary stories are on the way soon, so stay tuned and be sure to send me your story at darkstories.org. Remember, I'm looking for tales about sea monsters and other out-at-sea tales, as well as lockdown stories unrelated to current events. If you want to support the show, check the links in the description. And until next time, here are the credits from my patrons of all time. Now then, stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.